bulbs. G'day Frog Jim, welcome, welcome to the stream sir. Uh, yes, it's doing fine, fine indeed, fine and dandy. Finished your uh, your entry into the competition yet? That my girlfriend's judging the UV bucks. Two two men enter, one man leave. Huh. Pressure's mounting now, mate. Told Bucks this the other night. I reckon uh, I reckon you got him covered at the moment. We'll see, won't we? <laughs> no, no pressure, mate. Whenever you finish it, just teasing. Get out, Audrey. What's going on? Did you? That is unfortunate. Feel free to share or not. G'day, Shadow Yvray. What's happening, mate? friend how did the uh, the festivities go yesterday
So I have to say I've I've gone a real a real 180 on this piece. I started off absolutely pumped to paint this figure. And then I started it in that first stream that we started this figure just wasn't a good stream. Wasn't in the wasn't in the zone. Wasn't feeling the vibe. And I walked away after that stream thinking, fuck. I really thought I was gonna like that model. And then we came back on Sunday morning, beautiful Sunday morning stream. Great people doing Monte San Savino stuff, feeling the greatness. Just had a nice chill stream and all of a sudden we found a cool concept and a cool idea and we managed to pull something out of the fire that I am absolutely chuffed with. So I guess there's a lesson in that. Maybe the lesson is take some time, replenish. Maybe the lesson is sometimes you've just got to push through. <laughs> oh, Master Yoda says exactly the same thing mate, he says it slightly differently though, he says do or do not, there is no try. Motherfucker. It's probably one of my favourite things I've painted this year. <laughs> It's just out of nowhere. I'm not happy with the base at the moment, so we want to we want to work a little bit on the base tonight. And uh, one thing I'm struggling with is green. <coughs> just in general, the colour green. There's obviously a lot of green happening here, so. just creating enough variation between the greens of the, the uh, leaves and the greens of her skin tone. Only four days till wheel of time. What? Wonder how I'm gonna feel about the show. I had this weird feeling with Game of Thrones when I was watching it the first season. I was like, yeah, I'm not really into this show. Like I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the production values, but yeah, I was just like, well, that was cool, but. Um, 
And then in the end, when it got to material that I wasn't familiar with, uh, that was when I really started to get into it. But I will say that season four, probably season three and four with the Red Wedding and that sort of stuff, it was, it was awesome. But I wonder if I'll feel differently about the Wheel of Time because <clears throat> I'm actually much more connected to the Wheel of Time story because it is uh, the book series I grew up reading, whereas Game of Thrones, I was only a... Uh, part-time reader at maximum. I have read up to book four. Oh look, Game of Thrones has got some good elements. Wheel of Time's a little bit uh, less <coughs> sex position and uh, gratuitousness. Still some mature adult themes. Yep. You won't hear me argue with that sentiment at all. love to mate well yeah I, I actually so it was a Christmas present I got from my mum uh, when I was in grade three, believe it or not, I got the, Wheel, the Eye of the World, the first book in the series, and uh, I read it in grade three, which is grade three for um, people who aren't familiar with our schooling. I was um, nine or ten, I think. But however old I was, I was young. But my mum knew that I really liked reading. And I was reading way above my grade. And I think she sort of probably thought I'd see how it goes with this one. Maybe didn't think I would finish it or whatever. But yeah. So that was, that was the first... <coughs> that was the first uh, real book series. Real fantasy book series I read. And I, I absolutely devoured it. And... Um, I then got her to buy me the rest of them in the series, which at the time was uh, book five. So I read all up to book five, and then every year a new book came out. I'd be I'd be rereading the rest of the series again. So I think I've read the series probably thirteen times, fourteen times. You weren't lying about the potato photos, were you, mate? All right. How do you feel about it?
yeah, I think that's a that's about how I feel at the moment as well. Um, I like the ambiance that the the backdrop is creating, and I feel like it's uh, it's really good. Um, tricky thing to do, backdrops. I know I'm not very good at them, so I won't be commenting too much on that. Um, I would like to see it without the uh, natural shadow that's been created in that those pictures. Um, but yeah, promising I think. Uh, generally, uh, on backdrops sort of like that, you s probably want to see a little bit more diffused lighting around the bottom, perhaps. Um, yeah, I like the red flowers at the front here, tying in with the red of the dress. Uh, I like the colour palette in general. Uh, where I think you are struggling a little is you've got a lot of elements of texture, a lot of textural elements, and not too many elements that are smooth, creating that, that contrast. The face uh, thing is the only bit, um, and even then it looks a little bit rough. So that's yeah, that's kind of a style you can go with, like a very rough and um, aggressive sort of style. But I do think that the more um, you can create contrast between texture and smooth, contrast between warm and cold, and saturated and desaturated, and value, all of those things help to create a more visually interesting piece. Uh, so whether that's making that red fabric cloak super smooth um, not sure probably that's what I would do but not sure um, I actually think the natural lighting is really impacting my ability to provide good critique here because I think that the shadow in the background looks awesome. <laughs> um, and it helps frame the piece, which is awesome. But I don't know that it looks like that in, in the hand. It may look better. Yeah, I, I think keep, just keep chipping away on, um, you know those elements. There's, there's. It just feels a bit messy. So maybe it's time to clean up a bit and see if you can uh, see if you can get a more pleasing result by doing that. But it is very nice. Very nice uh, figure. I don't think I ever painted the, uh, ever painted the 75mm version of that figure. Painted the bust, obviously. Gave it away. This is how we do it. This is how we do it.
So yeah, if you didn't uh, if you didn't get much of a chance to watch the Monte San Savino streams over the weekend, uh, I believe that kept the vods up. Uh, went and watched some of those last night. Really cool, really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, Bucks and I were chatting yesterday about uh, about Danilo Cartacci, uh, who's one of the Italian painters who painted a uh, a bit on stream. Really interesting to watch. Um, really interesting to watch. Uh, they talk a lot about how historical painters are very different to fantasy painters. Um, and his approach was really, really quite something. I liked it a lot. What's a weird little symbol we can do here? I have indeed, Gimme H, yeah, I've painted, uh, I've, I've tried to stretch myself every, every few months or years and, and paint some historical stuff. There's a competition um, here in uh, Brisbane called Queensland Model Hobby Expo and it has quite a big, um, quite a big historical uh, field. So I try to enter something in there. I've actually got a historical uh, figure planned for our next figure. I'll show you because I'm excited for it. This is our next project, friends. We're leaving tonight. I swear there is nowhere to run. We're leaving town. Nah, we didn't. Nah, I'm still gone. It's this arm. Fernando sent me one. But we're going to start it anyway because I reckon it will take me a reasonable amount of time to paint each of those figures and I reckon I can just do the arm when it rocks up. I'm jazzed about painting them so don't want to, don't want to not paint something when I'm excited about it. No. It is actually, yeah, it's, um, it's from, uh, that's Vercingetorix, it was a, um, a Gaelic, uh, Germanic tribal leader who Julius Caesar defeated in battle and kept captured, I think, something like that anyway. Yeah, they're, uh, some Gauls, so it should be fun. Should be really fun. But the box art uh, was done. It was just released the other week. Outstanding.
know, I had absolutely no plans of doing anything like this, what I'm doing right now tonight. And yet here we are. If everything goes to plan, friend, we'll be starting those Germanic soldiers on Wednesday. Wednesday night. Cool. Forget about that plan. That was a terrible idea, Deno. What are you doing? That is up there with the worst ever symbols I've painted. I like it. Well done, Deno. Some of your best, pal. Amarillo, Intenso, Deep Yellow. Oh yeah. Amarillo, Intenso. So I want to want to really dive into this this theory of uh, warm warm colours at the top here. So we're just adding some yellow, and I'll bring it back down with a bit of green in a second. But just want this top area to be really warm.
Mad props to Dave Colwell for his paint job on this piece, by the way. Absolutely crazy. The guy is something very special. Very special indeed. Decided I wanted to make the horns darker, but I'm not sure if I want to do them darker towards the tips, towards the centre of the base. I think we'll go the base. So I wanted to do that to really just reinforce the face when you have lots of um, colors of a similar value, um, bits can get lost. So by just darkening some of those elements near her face, we're artificially creating a little bit more focus in that area. I feel like I might I'm going to do some airbrushing there, which feels crazy, but...
I've got to come up with a good a good color palette plan for that uh, for that Roman piece Gaelic piece do you know what I'm actually I'm really wishing that I went and got those Romans as well because they're they did actually do it a bust series like that with some Roman legionnaires which were awesome so who knows I may end up doing it I think you can still buy them is part of the reason why, why I would want to get them. It's that, uh, you know, that sort of practice that I'm craving at the moment. Lots of challenge. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I, I, I add work for myself, like I just do things that don't probably need to be done, don't really add much value to the, to the final piece. Usually when I'm, when I'm doing this sort of stuff, just fucking around, adding little tweaks here or there, but it's usually really fun, so. G'day Scott of Alaska, happy party Monday to you sir. And what a glorious party Monday it is. What did I change? I didn't change anything did I? Well, there's a little girl waiting at the counter of a corner shop. She's been waiting down there, waiting to spend points. Her dreams walk in and now they never stop. She's been pushed around by all of the customers. She gets to her feet and she says, What about Bunny? It isn't fair. I've had enough, now I want my share. Can't you see? I want to paint, but you just waste so much time, stupid customers. What about Bunny? What about Bunny? I wish I could say I was shocked.
Jakani baby, please, what can I sing for you? You tell me the tune, my friend, and I will make your world a little bit more depressing for a short amount of time. Look, friends, if Jakani Baby is not going to select a song, I will be forced to choose a song of my own, off my own bat. Well, I was going to go, I was going to go a bit of classic Aussie rock. Rock on. Do, 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 do. Sometimes I think I'm just a little crazy. I don't even know my own name. Soon all of me will go all up in flames. Yeah. So hard when everything just runs against me. Jealous words. Turn into a love-hate frenzy Won't someone please understand Won't someone lend me a helping hand Won't someone please take the time to think Cause your actions and words They don't always say what they mean Why don't somebody say what they mean? Yeah So Everything just runs against me Mate, there's no tie. There's no admittance to Party Monday. Tie or equivalent. And actually, that's just a made up rule. You can wear whatever you like. It's just a formal way to appreciate how great life is. Clay Aiken, I do remember Clay Aiken. He was on an episode of Scrubs. He sang, Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she precious? Something, some, something, whoa. Isn't she precious? Some love. Why do you ask, Bunny? Why 
am I still persisting with this travesty of a paint job on this fucking symbol thing? Come on, guy. Pull yourself together, man. Dan doesn't remember what day it is half the time. I don't reckon Ben could organise his way out of a wet paper bag. Happy to be challenged. There, why did I decide to do that? I don't know. <laughs> I just felt like painting something else. I sort of was thinking about maybe doing some spirals down here or something. I don't know. I don't think I will because of how bad this situation went, but I'm still considering it. Just one of those little spiral patterns, you know? And the one where you go and the other one goes I'm doing it I'm fucking doing it get excited <laughs> in a maniac maniac on the floor alright so I'm going to start at this height I haven't seen you in forever, mate. How you going? Yeah. Good for you, buddy. Well, the great thing about hobbies is they're always there when you want them. Oh no, what have I done? My friend, I clocked 57 games of Mage Knight last year. Mm one of the peak solo periods of my life. And by that I don't mean solo, I was in solo. Big Dan I was writing solo. Just I was playing heaps of solo games. Outstanding game. Very, very, very uh, brain burner. I like it a lot. The there's usually an optimal pathway early. Like this is this is the correct thing to do at this part point. But that very quickly uh, expands into a broad decision space based on what's available on the board, what skills you draw. Yes, I do that sometimes. <laughs> it's 
Sorry, mate. My dad always said, we're not here to fuck spiders. And so if I go hard, if I go something, I go hard. Usually at the expense of other aspects of my life. Yes, Mage Knight, 10 out of 10, recommend. There's a fantastic uh, uh, playthrough, learn to play video series on the internet by a dude called Ricky Royal. So I highly recommend watching his little playthrough video series before you give it a crack, because it will melt your brain, I'm trying to keep track of all of the basics things you can do. Uh, I reckon I probably watched the third one as well. I didn't like Paul Grogan's videos, or video. I normally don't mind him, but he just didn't didn't operate at a high enough frequency for me with uh, Mage Knight. But Ricky Royals was was the guy. Yeah, the third one was was by a dude, a weird looking dude. Um, I reckon cardboard something. Ricky, Ricky's playthrough is just like, yeah, let's have a play and I'll explain as we go. And it just, I just clicked with it. That's the front on view. This little bit in here. More important than I realised. I reckon a little, little dot in between could look cool. No. All right, I reckon uh, 
I don't reckon we've got too much more we need to be doing. Well, if you're interested in the Wheel of Time, friends, I'm going to give you a little Cliff Notes version of the Wheel of Time, not in, not in a spoilery way. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the world and if it's something you may be interested in. Good, mate. Well, I'm up to the fifth one myself, and uh, I'm reminded that they just continue to get better. So, enjoy that. Enjoy that a lot. Uh, Alright. Wheel of Time. So, the Wheel of Time is set in a... Uh, fantasy world. Where... Um, the actual world itself is driven by the tapestry of ages and the threads of people's lives are um, what weaves the tapestry or what the tapestry is woven from but the wheel of time is actually the thing that weaves it so you get lots of sayings like the wheel weaves as the wheel wheels to explain why shit happens in your life which is why it's called the Wheel of Time. So there's a lot of uh, time is cyclical type of concepts in it. And Robert Jordan drew really heavily on a lot of um, uh, interesting religious subtext throughout the series. None of it's overt really, some of it is, but for the most part it's all pretty subtle but there's a lot of cool stuff there if you look into it. Anyway, so the Wheel of Time weaves the, the tapestry of people's lives um, and as I said time is very cyclical and so there is a uh, um, an age um, that people call, refer to the Age of Legends which is a time in a previous um, era thousands of years prior um, and during that age it's called the age of legends everyone um, had access to crazy technologies and all sorts of cool shit and one of the uh, coolest things that they had access to was a thing called the one power so the one power is what drives the wheel and spins the wheel of time um, and it's comprised of two equally powerful halves of one whole. And those two halves are called Seydin and Seydar. The two halves of the one power. So there's, uh, there's a lot of iconography in the Wheel of Time. And one of the iconography elements is um, a... Uh, what's that thing called? With the white and the black... You know what I'm talking about. Someone, someone will help me out here. Very Japanese symbol. I can't think of the name, but yin yang. Sure, thanks, Wes. Yeah. So the 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 white half of the one power in the yin yang description is uh, Sadar, which is what the female 
channelers in the world, female users of the One Power. People who use One Power are called channelers. Uh, SADAR is what females access. And if you take the little white um, part of the yin yang out, uh, it looks like a, a flame. So a lot of the uh, female channelers, um, who I'll come to in a second, uh, have this flame as their symbol. The male channelers, they used Sadin, which was the male half of the source. And their little black symbol looks like a claw or a fang. So their symbol's called the dragon's fang. Anyway, so the channelers in the world use this one power, usually in harmony, using it together to do wondrous things, wondrous activities with the one power. Um, would have been quite marvellous, I think, living in the Age of Legends. They had access to super advanced technology and then all of this, all of this power that they could do whatever they wanted with. Anyway, some of the uh, some of the channelers out there in the world, um, and back in this back in this time, they were called Eyes Sedai. Um, male and female were also called Eyes Sedai. Uh, they stumbled across a new source of power um, and they thought that it rivaled the power of the one power and that they wanted to tap into it and use it to help further their research do all sorts of stuff what they didn't realize at the time dun 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 was that this other source of power that they could feel it existed outside of the pattern of ages outside of the pattern and it was actually a prison for a, a being called the Dark One who is the um, opposite of the creator the, the person, thing, being who created uh, the wheel and the ages and all that sort of stuff so the people in the Age of Legends found this source of power. They drilled through the pattern to discover that they had unfortunately made an egregious error and they had partially released the Dark One. Yeah, they, they definitely won't mention Sanderson until the end, I don't think. So by not quite fully opening the prison, the Dark One was able to influence the happenings in the world. And so the Dark One, uh, although he couldn't directly uh, do things at that time, he made a stunning counter-stroke against all of the people in the world. He corrupted the male half of the One Power. So he turned it from the same pure energy that all I said I used into something that was uh, corrupted and tainted and Jordan uses some awesome descriptions in his book uh, but one of my favorite one is the way that he describes how the male half of the of the uh, the source the one power was tainted he said it, it was like an oil slick on top of a, of a clear still lake so you, you knew the water was there and and you knew it would be delicious and pure, but to get to the water, you had to put your hands through this slimy, sickly, oil filth. And I found that to be really quite well described. I always enjoyed that. Anyway, so and what that what happened was every single man who had access to channeling the one power was doomed to eventually go mad because touching this, this taint would, would slowly over time weaken their mind. Well, I'll get to that in a sec, Wes. Uh, so, what happened is all of the men that were channelers went bonkers and they basically destroyed the world. It was called the breaking of the world. 
and they uh, use the one power and, and, and ripped apart the world. The most powerful of the male channelers, his name was Luz Therin. <laughs> Luz Therin Telemon. And he was uh, called the Dragon. That was his like his moniker that people called him by, his title. And so he was the most powerful and he uh, went absolutely crackpot crazy as well. Killed his wife, killed his daughter, or whatever. And went mad. Some of the people that were in that, uh, that age decided, you know what? Yeah, I am, I am just, I'm gonna tap in with this guy, this, this dark one. I'm sure he's not that bad a guy. Let's fucking sign up to work for him. So there was 13 of the most powerful Aes Sedai in the Age of Legends decided to just pick up, pick up their camp and join with, uh, with the Dark One. And so Luz Therin and the rest of the, the Aes Sedai who were fighting on the side of good, they didn't go mad straight away in many cases and they had a, had a fight against, uh, against all of these other people that were called the Forsaken. And anyway, in the end, the Forsaken were bound back in a prison uh, alongside the Dark One, but the prison was imperfect. And doing so um, created the breaking of the world. So all civilization basically was toppled um, and the whole history of the world changed course and became a more medieval time period. The start of the first book is a chapter where Luster in Telamon is um, basically walking around his house and he's bonkers, he's absolutely mad. And one of the Forsaken, the most powerful of the Forsaken, his name is uh, Ishamael. He, uh, he basically comes to his house and he's like, you're cooked, mate. But there was a prophecy written um, by someone at some point uh, who said that the dragon would be reborn and that he would break the world again. But in doing so, he would save the world. So people, uh, and the, the story is set 3,000 years after this time happens, so people are obviously like, well, the dragon reborn is a, is a dude who's supposed to save us, but he's also going to fucking destroy everything, right? So <clears throat> that's the premise of the, the backstory. And the series is set, as I said, 3,000 years later in a, in a more medieval styled world. So the starting location is a place called the Two Rivers. Um, and it's like a generic farm town place where wonderful people live. Uh, those people are very uh, ancient bloodlines. They've lived there pretty much since the breaking of the world and they're very stubborn and rooted in their ways. The old two, two rivers of folks. Um, and they belong to a, a civilization back in the age of legends who were noted for their drive and stubbornness and yeah, fighting against the shadow. Um, and so in the, uh, in the current time, there is several big uh, nations that, that exist, that, get, it, you, that you travel through. Um, the first and the coolest of all the nations is the people who live on the borderlands. So where the, where the people actually took the, uh, the Dark Ones prison thing, um, that also got warped and, and twisted and became a place called the Blight. And the Blight slowly, it's this big natural, uh, unnatural part of the world where weird creatures live and all of the evil critters live. And slowly, year by year, the Blight is creeping out, corrupting part of the, the natures of the humans. Uh, and uh, the people who live on the border of the Blight, they're called Borderlanders, and they are some of the coolest characters. So there's different nations there that live in the Borderlands. 
then there is uh, the remaining Aes Sedai. So as I said, all of the male Aes Sedai were doomed to go crazy. The females were not. Females were sweet. And so what ended up happening is all the females took um, took control of the Aes Sedai and they live in a place called the White Tower. And they are basically the people who rule behind the scenes. So there are kings and queens in the world. All of them have Aes Sedai advisors who will manipulate them, uh, do lots of things. Now, the Aes Sedai swear an oath when they're when they become full Aes Sedai, to uh, never, never lie. But the truth that they tell is not always the truth that you hear. It's very, very clever. They'll often uh, obfuscate the truth by manipulating people around them. They don't ever outright lie, but yeah, they manipulate things to their advantage. So those, the Aes Sedai are an integral part of the story, and the character that Rosamund Pike plays is an Aes Sedai who is out hunting for the dragon reborn. So the Aes Sedai are split into seven Ajars, which is just like um, houses in Gryffindor, or houses in Hogwarts. They have different things that they focus on. So for example, the yellow Ajar they're healers. They focus on using the one power to heal people. The white Aja, they're the lawmakers. No, sorry. The white Aja are logic. they philosophical. The grey Aja are the lawmakers. They act as judges. The green Aja are the battle Aja. So they go and fight against Shadow Spawn, the Dark One's creatures. The blue Aja dedicate themselves to causes. Moiraine, who is the lead character played by Rosamund Pike, she has dedicated herself to a cause of finding the Dragon Reborn. And finally, the Red Aja. And the Red Aja are the most interesting. They, uh, they spend their time trying to hunt down men who can channel. Because if they don't catch men and channel who can channel, then eventually they'll go mad and destroy everything. So they find and hunt down men who can channel. Over the past 3,000 years, there's been several men who've claimed to be the Dragon Reborn. Haven't actually been the Dragon Reborn, but have claimed it. They're called False Dragons. Uh, and the story starts with a False Dragon, or a Dragon, depending on what you believe, who starts the show, starts the book, being captured by the Red Aja. He's a cool character. His name's Logain, Logain Abla. Hello, Neshland. So, yeah, that's the White Tower. There's heaps of other civilizations and so forth. Not too many of them have much uh, that I can share without spoiling stuff. But the story focuses on a really cool concept. Yep. I think it's fair to say that Sanderson was heavily influenced by Robert Jordan, and one of the reasons why they picked him to write the, the rest of the series was for that reason. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the book series uh, a lot of really cool themes in it. It's a it's a flipped universe in many ways. Like it's a very matriarchal society. Females are pretty much in power in most places, and there's a lot of powerful women. Um, yeah, creates creates a really uh, interesting uh, dichotomy to a lot of other fantasy series in that regard. 
was about to start on a different tangent then and I don't remember what it was. So I'll tell you a little bit about the main characters. The series focuses on... Oh yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about to Varen. The series focuses on some characters from the Two Rivers, obviously. Uh, there's five key characters that the stories focus on. And Moiraine believes one of those characters is the Dragon Reborn. There are females in the book that can channel uh, the male half of the power, and there are males who can channel the female half of the power. So there is every possibility that the Dragon Reborn will be a female as well as a male. They just don't know. All Moiraine and the eyes that I know is that they need to find the Dragon Reborn so they can help that person fulfill the prophecies to prove that they are the dragon. So, uh, these, these five characters, <coughs> they're all a thing called Taviran or Taveran, depending upon how you choose to pronounce it. And Taveran is another interesting concept, quite unique to Robert Jordan, that I feel is so clever. It's actually like Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the hell now. I don't know if you... Buffy the Vampire Slayer is like, whoa, how can so much shit happen in this one place, this one tiny little fucking town? Well, their explanation is because there's a hellmouth. And the hellmouth encourages lots of nasties to come out of there. Well, in Robert Jordan's book series, uh, he has this concept called Taveran. And they are um, people who shape the uh, pattern around them. So normal people, normal people in the Wheel of Time, their, their threads of their life are already woven. They just have a, a boring life that's planned out by the wheel. And they just live and die and do what, do whatever they're told to do. But, Taviran actually shape the, the pattern around them. So they change what happens. Um, by their actions. So the whole premise of being Taveran, which is different and makes more sense, is you're always like, well, why is all this shit happening to these people, these small people? Well, because these people are the ones who are shaping the world around them. That's why they're the ones who uh, all of this weird stuff is happening to. So... Hmm, Uh, the story uh, has lots of twists and turns, so I'm not giving anything away here, but there are five main characters. The first one is Rand Al Thor. So he's a, a, a farmer from the two rivers. And his dad is um, been quite private with his life. Rand doesn't know too much about his dad and what his dad did. Uh, and he's absolutely confirmed to be a Taveran. Taveran. All of this information I'm giving you is available on the Wheel of Time uh, website for the advertising the show. I'm not giving anything away that isn't already available on the internet to read if you're interested. Uh, next person, one of Rand's friends, his name's Perrin. He's a blacksmith, or blacksmith's apprentice. He's a big unit of a big hunk of a, hunk of a lad. Uh, also a Taviran. And then finally there is uh, the third one of their friends. His name's Matt Trim Cawthon, Matt. He's a, uh, technically he's a farmer, but he's more of a scallywag. He's a rapscallion. He's a ne'er-do-well, one of those characters. Also, a fan favourite. And those are the three male Taviran from this one town that are all friends. And then we have uh, some female Taviran. Uh, one of them is called Egwene. And she and Rand have been promised to wed for many years. And she is the daughter of the village mayor. 
runs the inn, the innkeeper, innkeeper's daughter. And then the last one, who is uh, not a Taviran, but very integral into the story. Her name is Nynaeve, and she is the village wisdom, which is like a soothsayer, or an old village um, herbalist lady. And there is a... This is a fucking hard one to crack. There is a prevailing um, theory that most village wisdoms possess some innate ability in the one power. Indeed, there is 14 books, yes. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Why is there no superglue in any of my superglue containers right now? Thank you. Yep. So the story follows the journey of these five people and the many trials and tribulations they find themselves in. Uh, I'm sure it will surprise you not at all to learn that some of those characters have the ability to channel the one power and that one of those characters is the dragon reborn. Wouldn't be much of a story, would it? But the way that the, um, the story progresses is very, very interesting. Uh, I I have a tattoo on my chest of the Dragon Reborn, the symbol of the Dragon Reborn, which should give you an indication of how much I enjoy the series. But it isn't for everyone. It is a lot. There's a lot to take in, a lot of books to read, which is actually one of the reasons I like it because it is so in depth. But yeah, it's full on. But there's some great characters I haven't even talked about. Wow. Aes Sedai, female Aes Sedai, have this... Uh, uh, this bond that they have with um, a male... all the females, all the Aes Sedai females in this, in this age. So they have access to uh, this thing called uh, a bond with a, with a male, usually, well, always male. And these males are, are granted speed and strength, uh, endurance above the kin of normal men. They become attached to their female Aes Sedai. Well, in the book series, Nynaeve, or Mo Moiraine, sorry, not Nynaeve, Moiraine, who's the Aes Sedai hunting for the dragon reborn. She has a warder. His name is Lan. And he is the greatest character in the series, in my humble opinion. Absolutely outstanding character. Yeah, look, they are, they are super long. And to provide some criticism of the books, they they lost their way a little bit in the middle of the series. So the first the first three books are unreal, like just popping. The story mo moves at a rapid pace, and it's very little wasted time. And then the fourth, fifth, and sixth books they start to meander, but you feel like it's a really good meandering because the stories that it's telling. Um, are just awesome and, and many people would say that the fifth, the fourth and the fifth books are the best books in the series. Um, completely different direction to what you expect the series is going to go in, but really good. Um, the seventh book is where it starts to lose its way a little bit and um, the eighth and ninth books are considered pretty poor. The tenth book and the eleventh book are considered the worst in the series. And unfortunately that is where Mr. Jordan passed away and Brandon Sanderson was brought in to finish the series. Last three books, Brandon Sanderson. If you like Brandon Sanderson and his writing, you'll like them. 
If you don't, stay away. But on the whole, uh, it is a series that I am thrilled to see brought to life. I think there will be some awesome visuals. The the evil the evil creatures, the creatures of the dark one, they're called Trollocs. And they're just beastmen, right? It's a different name for dudes with beastie heads and shit. But they look unreal. Uh, that whole that whole stuff, that whole scene, with all of the all the Trollocs that I saw in the trailer looks so legit. And there you go. Thus endeth my Wheel of Time conversation. So if you were bored during that, I very much apologise, but at the same time, it's my stream and I am the king. So, so be it. I get to talk about whatever I want. while I'm painting my little toy soldiers. I have in fact listened to the entire audiobook series of The Wheel of Time. And indeed, it took a very long time. <laughs> Better part of a year, I think, I actually spent on it. Outstanding. Let's have a look and see if there's anything we need to do before I throw some varnish down. I'll just quickly do some airbrushing first. Come from Captain Adjo. I just want to talk about the cool shit that happens in the Wheel of Time. There's some epic moments.
All right, let's zoom in and have a look, shall we? What do we do with a drunken sailor? What do we do with a drunken sailor? What do we do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? Ah, uh, Nolan, g'day. We're just having a look to see if there's anything I need to tweak. Started strong tonight. Delightful. Let the Punga games begin. Okay, well, um, I like that. Let's maybe do a little bit of this activity. G'day Wavy, what's happening mate? Yes, it's Party Monday mate, we always wear a tie on Party Monday. Um, okay, well, I like this, I like the cloak, I like the skin tone, I maybe just need to sharpen up a bit there. This little bit here.
Um, I like it. I actually just oh, I actually don't like the eyes at the moment. Let's zoom in on the eyes. How close can we zoom? This dot doesn't look right. Well, you made that worse, Deno, but good try. Sure, Scott. I would love to. I'm going to varnish that. That's the only thing that I want to fix. We call it, call it a day. So Scott, I'll give you I'll give you my traditional caveat. I try to adjust my feedback level uh, appropriate to the skill of the painter. Uh, but irrespective of the skill level, I feel it's very important to provide critique honestly, and I will do so to the best of my ability. Can't promise my feedback will be good. But I can promise you that I will give it freely. Until I start a Patreon. And then I will charge $40 an hour for it. leave her to dry. She can be tremendously looking right there. Let's have a look at Scott of Alaska and his paint job. Alright, well, my first question usually this question is how do you feel about it While you're considering answering that, let me let me provide you some critique. So, I love LEDs. Um, I think they're awesome in figures. 
I want to do more with them. Um, they do have a downside, in my opinion, which is that they are really intense and vibrant, and they really can overtake a model. Um, and so my first observation is that uh, the the areas around the LED, which will catch natural um, glowing reflections when you're holding it in your hand, um, I would like to see those be artificially increased, the highlights around that area, because firstly, it reinforces the impact of the LED, um, but secondly, it really allows that light to reflect off those areas even more intensely, which is leaning into the effect. So. Um, by that I mean that the panels around his uh, neck and his head, um, you could probably take those up to a brighter white. Um, my second observation is uh, the model feels very messy. So it's a delicate balancing act with weathering. You want a figure to look weathered and textured and detailed, but you don't want it to look messy. Um, because messy means you can't really tell you know, elements apart. And there's, there's probably two schools of thought on this. If, if you really want to do like super messy, dirty, rusty, you can, and that's a, that's a whole style, that's a whole different conversation. But for figure painting, the scale that we do, um, there needs to be a clarity of, of different elements because the models are so small. So if you don't have a clear separation of bits and pieces, it can it can get lost on the table. And so where I feel like this is going wrong is there's there's a lot of streaks and grimes and elements that are that are messy, which is causing it to get a little bit blurry. Um, some examples of where you've done it well, uh, I think on this on this back doobie whacker. Um, you know, you've got clear, three clearly separate elements, gold, black, greyish colour, and then there's some streaking on the grey and some other little weathering elements in other bits and pieces. But you can clearly see each of those defined elements. Whereas if you go and have a look here on the front breastplate, aside from the red doobie whacker things, it's a bit harder to, sell, to tell what's going on. Same with the hands, you know, there's a lot of things in there, I can't really tell what each of those things are. So, trying to trying to balance how much weathering versus keeping those elements um, complete. So, the way I usually try to do it, and I don't know if you did this um, or not, but I try to paint everything cleanly and then weather afterwards. So you can add weathering a little bit at a time and see how it looks. If you try and do weathering from the start, it tends to it tends to not look right. It either tends to go too far one way, not enough or or too much. Um, I break the, I break that rule all the time though because there's different techniques I use to do weathering stuff. So I did a cool thing on salt weathering. If you want to watch that on my stream the other night, yeah. Hi mittens, good good uh, feedback there as well. Yeah. So, uh, I can't zoom in on this, but if you have a look at his right leg, there's two little streaks um, running down from a section there. They just don't look right, they don't look normal, they don't look correct. Um, they just look like you've blobs some paint on there. Uh, so, my third and final um, piece of advice, which I give to pretty much every painter, um, is you need to have a, uh, a more specific shift between uh, high value, so bright colors, and dark colors, like low value colors. So at the moment you go gray, high value gray, high value orange, high value red, high light blue, uh, more gray. The only areas where you've got a separation, and interestingly this, this back things, once again, what I'm going to draw to, you've got, again, those three clear elements, three different colour values that is making it easier to see what those things are. Hello, mittens. So, the way you fix that, um, whenever you're painting an element, whatever colour you're painting said element, if it's a bright colour, great. If it's a dark colour, great. 
the next piece of uh, element object thing that sits beside it make it the opposite so go light dark light dark light dark um, even if you just do that simplistically where you're like cool so I've painted this armor panel in steel which is a bright color the clothes next to it are going to be black it's going to be fabric black fabric and then the skin tone is going to be bright and then the hair is going to be dark right that's a very simplistic approach towards creating contrast in your figures. Um, there's more to it than that, but let's master that before we talk about the more elements. Kudos, sir, for popping yourself out there and asking for some feedback. It's one of the only ways to improve as a painter is to get critique. Uh, have fun. Keep painting toy soldiers. Kick some fucking goals, man. How good. I think we'll call her Done Friends. Alright, I'm going to go very, very quickly spray her with my lovely spray varnish. I'll be back in 12 to 13 seconds, maybe a bit more. I have returned. Uh, yes, well, I recently, up until recently, I only ever used Tester's Dull Coat, but uh, recently I've been using this Tamiya uh, TS80 Flat Clear. Very nice, actually. I like it. I think I might even like it more than the, uh, than the Tester's. Um, and if you're wondering why I do that, uh, I like the finish. It's kind of a kind of a dull, uh, but at the same time, mm, satiny finish. Uh, no, no. What I find every now and then, if you go too heavy, you'll get little little globules on there. But uh, yeah, you can usually just tap them; they get too globuly. But it also helps fix them and, and make them a bit stiffer. Let me answer that. Shadow you've read. The reason I use the spray through that enamel can is because I feel like it gives a much firmer seal than the AK. The AK finish, and you would have noticed I did my airbrush AK before I did the testers because I like the finish of the AK and I feel like the testers just reinforces that and then seals a little bit better. So that's why I do that. I've actually decided. Uh, to put some water effects on this. Often bases um, should be moist. Should be. Because nature is wet. So I'm just going to use this still water from AK, which I have sitting over here. Or maybe I'll use some Mod Podge gloss. Put on the vortex mixer. Uh, yeah, so that's why I use that. Moist. Mmm, moist. Oh, 
I have no real like specific thing I'm trying to do with this. I just think that a little bit of moisture in natural stuff looks more correct. Moist. He wrote a, he did a very good video recently actually, Miniac, which I sent him a message for. Worth watching, he painted a little lizard man for his friend, who lost his little bearded dragon, and he just wanted to do something nice for him, and but the premise that he was talking about in his video was that many people uh, get so caught up in the results and they look at things like, oh this is shit house and why am I not better at blending or highlighting or blah 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 blah. And they get so worked up on those things that they forget the fact that, hey man, you painted a cool little toy soldier and you're actually really good because how many people in the world couldn't do what you just did? Give yourself a pat on the back. It was quite a nice video I thought. It was a reinforcing of a lot of my mentality on painting. Probably why I liked it so much. Alright, we're going to do something a little bit crazy tonight. Get ready. All right. Boom shakalaka. I don't think we use the Mod Podge. Nobody's ever ready, but we're doing it. Just hair dry that bad boy. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna try and show you my setup for taking photos. on stream. Should be interesting. Should be interesting. Alright. Fun. Let's do the best bit. The best bit. This is one of those things you could make an ASMR video on. People peeling tape off bases. Oof. Just get in. Oof. That's so crisp. Oh, look at that. Woo -hoo -hoo. Delightful. You love to see it. All right. Let's do this. I have to start doing twenty two soon. Boom. Yeah. All right. So let's do let's do this first. So I'm gonna grab my camera down. Stand by. Ugh. This will be interesting. Okay. Here we go. So I just have a generic camera. I went and bought it. It was a, it was the cheapest chips. Um, it's, I haven't got a proper lens or anything. I've just got the lens that the camera came with. Uh, so. I've still got my plastic on the uh, on the thing, which is no doubt going to help. 
So, uh, I use all of my settings in manual, not automatic. So the key settings that we need to look at here are the ISO. You want that to be 200 or 100. Generally people recommend 100. I don't know what that is. I use 200. Perfect. This thing here is called the aperture. I don't even know what that is really. But I think it's how long the shutter stays open for. I'm going to peel the plastic off. Alright, I will. Just for you. Just for you. And then this thing, I don't know what that is either, really. But that's the settings I use. Uh, great. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go get my tripod. I've got a little tripod rigo, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'll do my camera a bit first. So stand by. Going to get to see behind the scenes here. It's big Dano's pants. Hello. Big Dano setup. Outstanding. Might just switch this to manual focus, auto focus. Great. That's my setup. How good. Stand by. I'm just going to uh, lift this up so you can see a little bit better what's happening. Hope you can still hear me. You should be able to because my microphone's pretty good. So this is my this is my little setup. Very good. Yeah, there you go. ISO, great. Thanks, Mini MF. So what I'm going to do now is grab my tripod. Hello, friends. Yes, I'm here. Hello, big demo. have the uh, main light which is this one here which I have focused on the model from pretty much directly on and then I have this one here which is the second light which just catches some of the shadows and shit that the first light doesn't get and they're both just my painting lights this one I use for my face this one I use for my model so here is my tripod, it actually sits on my desk, perfectly perfectly angled there to fit on my desk. There you go, if you ever want to know what any of these camera things are, just ask the people in the chat, they will tell you. Great, I need to get my memory card, hang on, it's in the computer room, stand by. So one of the trickiest things with taking photos uh, is the background. If you get the color, if you get a white background, the color gets very uh, washed out, unless you get the settings right. You're better off going with a gray background. Um, black background is like taking photos hard mode. So. Um, but when you've got a black background, if you set all of your settings to basically what I've set it to, um, the shutter speed stays open for a little bit longer, which means that it catches more light and the black background just gets lost, muted, disappears. So uh, I can't really show you the pictures that are coming out, obviously, but they look pretty good. You'll see them later on tonight when I upload them. So I just take a couple from each angle and then pick the best ones. Tripod is essential for this. If you try and hold your if you try and hold your um, camera steady, you'll get micro shuddering. Very hard to do um, good photos when you're uh, holding it. I've done it, 
but it's very hard. Great. So this is always set up for me, which is super cool, because it means I've now taken proper photos, studio photos of my, of my pictures, of my models, which is great. Uh, not everyone can have that area set up, um, like I can, but it's pretty easy to set up a proper photo area. That bit of fabric that you see at the back, I bought from Spotlight, which is a um, fabric place, craft place. It was three dollars for a meter of velvet, and I bought a meter of suede as well. Um, I bought some little plastic display stands that you get at like a stationery store and that's just tucked in behind them so you can move them around wherever you want um, and then you just you can use your painting light right so you could literally set up a little a little booth right in front of your painting area where your light is and get your tripod at waist height and take a photo directly in your painting area. That is what I would recommend if you don't have the capacity to have a setup like mine. Um, see you mate, have a good one. Uh, took me a long, long time to get good at photos and I still don't think I'm, I'm that good at them. Colwell's excellent. He, he could probably tell you more about the settings. I've sort of found a settings set up by tweaking different things that's worked for my setup and I've stuck with it. A lot of my photos come out probably a smidge darker than I would like, but you can post add brightness and value um, back in because all of the information's there um, in the photo in the format. You just need to make those afterwards amendments. So uh, there you go. That is that is my photography setup. Any questions? <laughs> Well, no, no, I don't. I've got the second. I've got the second light. I've got the two lights, um, so I don't worry about a second one. What's the brightness set out on the camera? On my on my the camcorder that you're looking at here, or the actual camera? Looks like my camera's frozen too. Good timing. That's okay. We're about to sign that off anyway. Uh, no, the DSLR, I'm not sure. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at the settings on that. White balance, brightness, one 100, f-stop 10, ISO 200, that is it, that I can tell you. There may be something else on there, not sure. All right, well, that was fun. Something a bit different. Yep. Yeah. Neither am I. <laughs> Canons, I think, are supposed to be better for miniature photography, for whatever reason. Literally, as a $550 camera, it was the cheapest camera I could get. I spoke to my sister and my dad, who are both mad keen photographers, and they said, you should be able to take pretty good photos with that. And I, at the time when I bought this, didn't feel like I needed to spend metric shit tons on a camera, because I didn't think my work was very good, probably accurately at the time. But yeah, you can you can definitely take um, good photos without a good camera. The lens is actually what my my mum and dad said, or my sister and my dad said to to throw into, but I didn't. 
let's have a look at someone we can raid, friends. Whom do we have here? So, I see we have CHK Studio. His model's on the way that I purchased. It's on the way. I'm excited. See you, Scott. The Bro Zerker. He's new. I don't think I've seen him. Real Rad Horn. This guy's dressed in a suit. Is he? No, he's got a crazy mustachio. Wow. Great. What are you doing, champion? I can't hear him for some reason. But he's Scottish. I do like that. He's got a lot of followers, though, even if he's only got 16,000 people. Oh, Hados Barbados. I do love Harbaitos. Some reason why audio isn't working today. Great. Well, I think we might raid uh, that other guy, the Brozerker. Because I don't think I've raided him. Let's do it. Alright friends. Hope you're all having a great night. Uh, let's raid the Brozerker. And... Let's have a... Fantastic week. I'm back on Wednesday night and we're going to start my super cool historical bust trio. So I'm pretty pumped about that. Thanks, friends. Have a glorious evening. Thanks for joining me. See you all next time. Big dinner. Wow.